a little bit okay. concerning. You ready? <clears throat> so um, the, Dr. Vint Cerf is, is uh, as close to a rock star as we have in this industry. See, you see how, you see how, and I'm going to pull out the father of the internet line as well. So um, these are, these are uh, common uh, uh, ways that people refer to Dr. Cerf. Um, most of you, I'm not going to go through a long introduction because there's a really good Wikipedia page that many of you probably helped edit. Um, but, but, well, it's true, right? That's the whole point. Um, but but this, is, this is a man who knows a lot about what we do more than most of us do. And he has a lot of perspective, you know, going back from the protocol days to the industry side, understanding, you know, why, how we ended up here and where the heck we're going. And it's that where the heck we're going that many of us have some deep concerns about. So, um, Dr. Sir, welcome. Thank you very much. The first, uh, I, oh, come on. Okay. <laughs> You know, I always get nervous when people clap when you get up. They figure it's not going to get any better, so you might as well just sit down. Uh, first of all, I really appreciate the opportunity to come back to, uh, to Los Angeles. Uh, some of you may know I grew up here. I lived for 30 years in California, eight of them uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area at Stanford, but the rest of them here in uh, the San Fernando Valley, in fact, where all those big fires are burning right now. Uh, one of the things that I worry about in addressing a group like yours uh, is that, uh, well, this is kind of like the talking dog story. You remember the story about the guy that finds a talking dog? And he takes it around and he shows this dog at you know, events like this. And people really love it. It doesn't matter what the dog says. What's amazing is the dog can talk at all. And I'm feeling a little bit like the talking dinosaur uh, who, uh, who shows up from uh, the Jurassic uh, to entertain you. Uh, the, uh, the little uh, gnome over there, I uh, was reminded, uh, belonged to John Postel. It was in his office. It was the first gnome to have an IP address. And uh, since we're talking about uh, John Postel, I'm sure many of you will recall that John passed away on October 16th, 1998, and we're coming up on the 10th anniversary of, of his passing. I know uh, I certainly miss him, and he'd be pretty amazed at what the Internet has turned into in the last 10 years. Finally, I wanted to make one other uh, observation about your upcoming meeting. Uh, Nanog 45 is scheduled to be in uh, the Dominican Republic. And I just uh, happened to have come away from a few days meeting in the Caribbean, uh, along with uh, uh, Ray Polzak from Aaron and others, meeting with the uh, uh, Caribbean Telecommunications Union. The people there are very determined to interconnect the islands with high-speed fiber where that's possible. I think that it would be very, very powerful to have the CTU group meet with NANOG and learn from you and share with you what they are hoping to do, because I'm pretty sure you'll be able to help them out. Okay, so let me start out just by uh, explaining something. Uh, my title at Google is Chief Internet Evangelist. And although I didn't ask for the title, somebody suggested it after I had proposed Archduke, and they said, well, that didn't quite fit in their nomenclature. Uh, if any of you are confronted with the opportunity to become an Internet evangelist, I can tell you that uh, the, the formal robes that you see there are literally the academic robes of the University of the Balearic Islands in Spain. So this is a, a real formal, legitimate academic outfit. You don't get to wear things like that very often. So I wore that on my first day of work at Google just for fun. I want to say thank you to every one of you and your colleagues who aren't in this room but are participating today and for all the ones who actually make uh, the Internet work on a day-by-day -day basis. Uh, it's really an incredibly hard job and I probably have less appreciation for what your life is like than many of you do, but I have great respect for people who can make this complicated and increasingly large system function successfully in the face of all the various attacks of viruses and worms and denial of service problems and broken code and uh, screwed up configurations and other kinds of things that no doubt pepper your day and your nights uh, with challenges. One thing which is really very encouraging is that while many of you may work for companies that are competing with each other, in some sense the Internet doesn't work without a lot of cooperation. And the fact that this particular group has been meeting now 44 times, three times a year for a long time, 
uh, simply reinforces my understanding and belief that the Internet doesn't work without a great deal of cooperation and collaboration. And you contribute very greatly to that. Uh, we're uh, entering a period where IPv6 deployment, in my opinion, is necessary. Some people are still debating that. And some people might have alternatives to propose. But in any event, uh, assuming that we continue forward on that path, you will have a very critical role to play in making IPv6 work together with and in parallel with IPv4. Uh, for one thing, making two systems run concurrently is a, a lot harder than having only one to run. If it were just IPv6, life would be somewhat easier, but it is not going to be that way. Network management with the new IPv6 formats is probably less mature than that which we're using for IPv4. You're going to have to live through that and, and in some ways contribute to its uh, uh, maturing. maturing. Uh, and finally, uh, the thing that I'm very concerned about is that the history of the Internet itself was one of global connectivity. When the core networks were the NSFNet, Backbone, and ARPANET, for example, anyone who connected to any network that was connected to those was connected to everything else. So the system started with a connected core, and it stayed that way for the most part, except when things broke. IPv6 is not the same because it's popping up in various places and just because you implement IPv6 doesn't mean that you're connected with some other piece of the network that's capable of running IPv6. So we aren't starting with a connected core and I think we need to fix that. And there are several ways that uh, one might do that. But to the extent that you have anything to say about policy in, in your various organizations, you might argue that if you already have an IPv4 peering agreement with someone, maybe you should agree to peer with v6 as well. If we were to succeed in that measure, then maybe we would have as connected a v6 network as we have a v4 one. I had also suggested to some of the network operators that they consider a liberal IPv6 peering policy for a period of time to assure connectivity even though one might uh, reserve the right to uh, disconnect or change the charging structure or something uh, later on uh, as the IPv6 traffic becomes a significant part of the flow. Uh, so finally, I wanted to tell you a little story about uh, what it's like uh, being in my position. I used to be at MCI uh, in uh, Washington, D.C. We ran a fairly large part of the Internet backbone and the Network Operations Center was in Cary, North Carolina. So I paid a visit one day, and as I was walking down the corridor, I saw this sign that had been posted on one of the network operators' cubicles, and it said, Vince Cerf may be one of the fathers of the Internet, but we're the mothers who have to make it work. And, and, and they were right. They were absolutely right, and that's exactly what you guys do every day. So I thought I'd just go back in time for a moment. This is what the original ARPANET looked like before uh, uh, the internet even was uh, a consideration. There were only four nodes. Uh, John Postel and I and Steve Crocker and Bob Braden and a few others were at UCLA working in Len Kleinrock's uh, laboratory, which is the network measurement center for uh, the ARPANET. I wrote the software that connected the Sigma 7 uh, to uh, the first node of the ARPANET at UCLA. The Sigma 7 is probably in a museum somewhere, and some people have suggested I ought to be there along with it. Uh, here I am. Uh, this is what the first packet switch at UCLA looked like. It was the size of a, re a refrigerator, and it was called an interface message processor. Uh, I remember DARPA reported, or no, it was Bolt, Baranek, and Newman that built these things, reported that they got a little memo uh, from uh, Senator Ted Kennedy uh, around the time that they got the contract to build the, the uh, BBNN imps, congratulating them on their ecumenical effort in building an interfaith message processor. <laughs> it, it's something had gotten lost in the translation. Well, as you all will remember from reading your history books, or maybe just a few of you, as I see a few gray beards here uh, living through this, will know that the ARPANET was a very successful project. And it led to uh, a desire to make inter uh, networking happen in other media, particularly mobile radio uh, and later uh, satellite. Uh, Bob Kahn, who is the other half of the original design of uh, TCPIP, went to ARPA and pursued a packet radio network design, which eventually was uh, implemented in the San Francisco Bay Area. SRI International did the systems integration. They built this nondescript looking bread truck that was filled with uh, packet radios that cost about $50,000 each. 
Uh, they were about a cubic foot in size. Uh, they uh, operated uh, at uh, 1710 to 1850 megahertz using spread spectrum, direct sequence spread spectrum technology, which is what CDMA uses uh, at Qualcomm, or I'm sorry, Qualcomm uses it uh, in their CDMA phones. Um, this was a pretty advanced piece of equipment for 1975. Uh, the, uh, the system could uh, transmit data between 100 and 400 kilobits per second. And uh, the, the, uh, this nondescript van used to drive up and down the Bayshore Freeway um, testing to see whether or not the uh, packet transmissions were, you know, what, uh, what packet loss we were experiencing, what kind of signal-to-noise ratio we were getting, what the effects of shot noise was from the generators on the cars and things like that. Uh, in case you uh, wonder what else we were doing with this stuff, uh, even in the mid-1970s, there was a great deal of interest in transmitting voice over these packetized systems. And Danny Cohen, who was mentioned earlier as one of the founders of Los Netos, who's sitting here in the front, was a big proponent of doing packetized voice. In fact, part of the reason that there is an IP in the TCP is that Danny and others insisted that we split off uh, a functional capability that did not require sequenced and guaranteed delivery. And there uh, came UDP, uh, and the TCP uh, split so we could support this kind of thing. Now, in the, uh, in the times when we were trying out packetized voice with the mobile radio system, uh, we had to reduce the data rate for the voice signal from about 64 kilobits a second, which is the normal uh, 8 bits uh, per, uh, per uh, cycle and 8,000 cycles per second sampling, down to about 1,800 bits a second. We used something called linear predictive code uh, with 10 parameters, or LPC-10, which modeled the voice track as a stack of cylinders. And as the voice was being, as the sound was being produced, uh, the uh, model assumed that these cylinders would change their diameter, and uh, you would transmit just the diameter information. So there were 10 parameters going to the other side, the uh, diameter of the cylinders plus the formant frequency <coughs> that uh, was detected. Now, you inverted that uh, transformation on the other side and you produce sound. Uh, the system lost a little bit of its uh, fidelity as a consequence of going from 64 kilobits to uh, 1.8 kilobits per second, but it was understandable. It did t seem to make anyone uh, speaking through the system sound like a drunken Norwegian. Uh, and so um, the day came when I had to demonstrate this system to some generals at the Pentagon. And I remember thinking, okay, how am I going to do this? And then I remembered that one of the participants in the packet voice experiment was Ingvar Lund from the Norwegian Defense Research Establishment. <laughs> so we had Ingvar speak through the ordinary telephone system, and we had him speak through our packetized voice system, and it sounded exactly the same. <laughs> so we never told the generals that everybody would sound that way as they came through this system. It's a very successful demonstration, though. Uh, you know, sweated that one out. Uh, so the packet radio system was actually very successful. It was uh, demonstrated and tested in field exercises with the uh, U.S. Army, and it, it stimulated a, an interest in continuing this effort to make packet switching work in other media. So uh, Bob Kahn and his predecessor, Larry Roberts at, at DARPA, also pursued a packet satellite uh, demonstration where we used Intelsat 4A with multiple ground stations on the surface uh, in the U.S. and in Europe, uh, vying for capacity uh, on, the, uh, on the satellite system uh, using a kind of Aloha-like technique. It was actually called CPOTA, which is Contention Priority Oriented Demand Allocation, which meant that you demanded uh, access, you announced your requirements in the Aloha period, and assuming everybody heard what the announcements were at all the ground stations, everybody calculated the same schedule for people to transmit without uh, interfering with each other. So that system was implemented, and it also worked very well. But now the question was, how do we get all these different networks to work together? Because they had different packet sizes and error rates and delays and speeds and everything else. So that was the problem that Bob Kahn and I started to work on uh, 35 years ago in the spring of 1973. Uh, we figured out roughly how to do it, published a paper in 1974, developed uh, a team at, uh, at Stanford University, uh, developed uh, the basic design of TCP uh, with the first spec coming out in December of 74 and by November of 1977 we had enough of these systems in operation to actually link them all together and so uh, we built uh, and tested a, the three network configuration 
on November 22nd, 1977. And the way it worked is the Bay Area uh, packet radio van was going up and down, transmitting data ostensibly to USC Information Sciences Institute about 400 miles to the south. But the gateways between the networks, we didn't know they were supposed to be called routers, so we call them gateways, uh, were uh, modified in order to force the traffic to go from the packet radio network into the ARPANET, all the way across the ARPANET through an internal satellite hop, then uh, down to, uh, uh, and landed in uh, Norway, and then it went down to London, to University College London on a landline, then it came out of UCL, out of the ARPANET, in effect, through another gateway to the packet satellite net, back over another synchronous satellite hop, all the way back to ETAM, West Virginia, through another gateway and into uh, the ARPANET, all the way down to USC Information Sciences Institute. Well, if you track the actual flow of the packets, each packet took about 100,000 miles one way to, uh, to get to the destination, even though it was only going about 400 miles as the crow flies. And I remember when it worked, the leaping around, screaming, it works, it works, as if it couldn't possibly have worked. And anybody who has anything to do with software will understand that it is amazing when any piece of software actually functions at all. So we were pretty excited about that. It was an important milestone because it showed that the architecture would actually work with three different networks all interacting with each other. We'd done pairwise experiments in the, in the uh, previous period of time, and you can almost make any pair of things work by hacking you know, interfaces and all these other things, but getting all three to work with the same set of protocols I thought was an important milestone. Well, if you fast forward to 1999, this is Bill Cheswick's uh, image of the topology of the internet back then, and about all you can tell is that it got bigger, it got more connected, and it got more colorful, and that's as good a definition of internet as anything I've ever heard. So let's see where we are roughly, whoops, let's go back, uh, where we are today. There are over a half billion servers on the network, not counting laptops and, uh, and uh, uh, PDAs and other kinds of episodically connected equipment, almost a billion and a half users. But in the same time frame that uh, the internet has been growing, so has the mobile telephone system, almost three, in fact, I've, he I've heard recently three and a half billion mobiles are in use, probably about 15% of them are internet enabled. If you look to see where the users are, it's a pretty astonishing transformation from where it started. Uh, originally, uh, the network was here in the United States, and for many years, North America was the largest single concentration of users. And you can see from this uh, chart that North America still represents uh, a, the highest uh, penetration of internet uh, anywhere in the, in the world at almost 75%. Uh, but the largest grouping of users is in Asia, uh, where there are almost 600 million users. We'll never catch up with that. So uh, what's important is to recognize that both Asia and Europe are the larger uh, concentrations of users in absolute numbers uh, than North America. This has implications. Uh, the languages that will be commonly uh, used on the net, the cultures, the interests, the customs, and the like, will, uh, will slowly shift to represent those more dominant users of the system, and we should be more or less in, uh, prepared for that. Uh, the other thing that's pretty obvious is that if you look at Asia with only 15% penetration uh, and 600 million users, imagine you know, what those numbers will look like when they get to the same penetration rate that we have uh, reached here in the United States. There's still a lot of work to be done elsewhere, and particularly in Africa, where there are a billion people living on the continent, but only an estimated 51 million with access to the net. Typically, there is access in most of the uh, capital countries, but it's pretty limited. If you drive around, as I did in Accra a few years ago, uh, the capital of Ghana, you count 30 or 40 internet uh, cafes, which is good news. It means that people are investing uh, in equipment and facilities to share access to the internet at a cost that they can afford. But over time, the cost will come down, equipment will get less expensive, the facilities will be more available, uh, and those countries, too, will become part of this internet environment. Uh, just looking at host growth, you can see on this log scale that uh, it was very, very rapid, especially during the uh, late 80s and uh, mid to late 90s. Uh, it's still growing, although not quite at the exponential rate that it was before. And if you look at uh, a more uh, a similar uh, chart from a shorter period of time, uh, you can see that we're still growing pretty substantially. Uh, I think that's still good news, despite the current economic climate and everything else. We've been through a dot boom and a dot bust in the internet, and in the end, 
there's been a very substantial growth rate in, despite all the various fluctuations going on. And the reason is obvious. This is such a useful system that it, uh, the demand for it will continue to grow. There's still plenty of room for new invention and new applications. Uh, this chart, many of you have already seen, it's uh, perhaps variations of it. It's the estimate of the number of uh, IPv4 addresses that are available uh, over time to be issued from IANA at ICANN, and Jeff Houston and his colleagues estimate that somewhere around mid-2010, uh, the ICANN allocations will have been exhausted, and then the RIRs will have used those allocations up probably within a year. Uh, this may actually telescope inward some because as more and more people recognize that IPv4 address space will be exhausted, they may try to gather more of it than they have now and there will be something of a run. To make things even more awkward, uh, there will probably be, if there isn't already, a kind of a gray or, or a black market in uh, IPv4 address space and you know what that means. It means fragmentation of the address means, uh, space, it means increasing number of uh, entries in the routing tables, increased amounts of routing uh, activity uh, just to make things uh, more difficult for us because while that's happening, we're also trying to introduce IPv6 which adds its own uh, address space, its own routing table entries uh, and its own algorithms that have to be run concurrently. So this is going to be a somewhat rocky period, I think, for, uh, for the Internet and in many ways what you do is fundamental to how we come out of it because implementing IPv6 uh, is going to be an important method for us to finally get past the uh, exhaustion of the IPv4 address space. So the sooner we get going, the better. I'm proud to tell you that Google has already started. At the end of January this year, we began working on and demonstrated uh, IPv6.google.com, which is access to our search engine, and we're continuing a pace to implement IPv6 throughout the system so that all of our services will be available well before uh, the runout occurs. I've talked a little bit about mobiles already, so I just wanted to uh, uh, reinforce the point that these are not just telephones. They are obviously programmable devices, uh, and they're being made to do all kinds of things that uh, telephones didn't used to do, payment systems, access to the Internet, and things of that sort. Uh, they're a challenging kind of device to work with. Uh, you know, like this BlackBerry uh, has a uh, video screen which is the size of a 1928 television set and that's pretty limited real estate and it's got a keyboard that's suitable for people that are three inches tall. So uh, that too is its own little uh, challenge. Uh, so uh, people are working to find better and better ways to interact with these devices. Some of them are going to be voice enabled and I'm sure you're going to see more and more applications in which uh, speaking to the internet rather than typing to it uh, will become a more common practice. One thing I have noticed uh, at Google is that people who are using mobiles and have access to the Internet are tending to ask questions that are relevant to where they happen to be at the time. And a lot of these devices already have either GPS receivers or they have uh, estimates of the location based on the radio triangulation to the base station of the uh, mobile. The consequence of that is that when you ask questions like where is the nearest restaurant, uh, that's a well-formed question if your location is sent to the system that's trying to respond to you at the time. Uh, I sort of understood that this uh, geolocation data was valuable, but I didn't viscerally appreciate it until my family went on vacation uh, last year uh, in May. We went to Lake Powell, which is uh, near Page, Arizona, and we decided to rent a houseboat and go out on the lake for a few days. And as we were driving into Page, Arizona, it occurred to us that we would need to figure out what food to bring on the boat because once you get out on the lake, there are no grocery stores. So we were talking about what kind of food we should uh, buy, and somebody says, why don't we make paella? And I remember thinking, well, that's a wonderful idea, but you need saffron to make a good paella. Where the heck am I going to find saffron in Page, Arizona? Well, as uh, luck would have it, I had a good GPRS signal, so I pulled out the, the BlackBerry, went to the uh, Google homepage and typed Saffron Page, Arizona grocery store, uh, and a bunch of several phone numbers popped up and little maps and addresses showing grocery store choices in the area. So I clicked on the telephone number and the, it, uh, the phone dialed or rang. Somebody picked up the phone and I said, uh, uh, hello, could I speak to the spice department, please? Well, this is probably some small little store, and it's probably the owner, and he said, this is the spice department. It, uh, you know, I said, do you have any saffron? <laughs> saffron? He says, I don't know, but I'll go look. So he comes back and says, yep, I've got some. 
So we followed the map on the BlackBerry to uh, the store, and I ran in and bought $12.99 worth of saffron. That's 0 0.06 ounces, in case you wondered. And we went off and made a really nice paella on the houseboat. So after that, I remember thinking, my gosh, you know, I just got information that I needed exactly when I needed it, and it was the right kind of information. I didn't get the information that you can get saffron in New York City 1,500 miles away. I needed to know where could I get it in Page, Arizona. So I've come away with much more, uh, uh, you know, uh, visceral appreciation for why geolocation information can be so valuable. Well, I think all of us are going to experience uh, not just an internet for everyone, but an internet for everything. And I've certainly been surprised to see the kinds of devices that have shown up on the internet in the ensuing 30 years since its original invention, refrigerators and picture frames and things that look like phones, but they're really uh, voice over IP devices. But I like this uh, internet-enabled surfboard that uh, some guy in San Diego put together. Uh, you know, that's what, that's what you do in San Diego, I guess. And, uh, I, all I can imagine is he was sitting on the water waiting for the next wave thinking, you know, if I had a laptop and my surfboard, I could be surfing the Internet while I'm waiting to get the next wave. So he built a, um, uh, a laptop into his surfboard, and they put a Wi-Fi server at the rescue shack back on the beach, and now he sells this as a product. So in case you're interested in uh, surfing the net while you're surfing, uh, you have an opportunity to do that. So I'm actually estimating that there will be uh, more things on the net than there are people. I mean, if you think of the number of appliances and devices that you carry around all the time, uh, you could kind of imagine that there could be anywhere from 10 to 100 things on the net that are serving you uh, while you're off doing other things. Um, things like web TVs or PDAs or mobiles or video games are all part of the Internet environment these days. Uh, there's even an internet-enabled washing machine, which turned out to be quite popular in uh, universities. Basically, you put your laundry in the washing machine, key in some information, and it will send you an SMS when the laundry is done. So you can go have a beer while you're waiting for your laundry to finish up, and then you go move it to the, the, to the dryer. Uh, I've often wondered what one would do with an internet-enabled refrigerator. Uh, it has a nice you know, liquid crystal display, touch-sensitive, on the, on the front of the door which I guess augments the typical American household communication, which is with paper and magnets. Most of us have paper covering the front of the refrigerator with little notes to each other. Now you can have web, uh, you know, uh, web pages and blogs and email and other kinds of family interaction. But I think it would be much more interesting if the things you put into the refrigerator had RFID chips in them. And if the refrigerator had a way of detecting what it has inside, then while you're off working, it's surfing the net looking for things that it could make for dinner. So when you come home, you see a nice list of possible recipes uh, for dinner. And you could extrapolate this idea, right? You could be on vacation and you get an email and it's from your refrigerator. Uh, it says, you know, I don't know how much milk is left, but you put it in there three weeks ago and it's going to crawl out on its own if you don't do something. <clears throat> or maybe you're shopping and you get an SMS it's your refrigerator again. Don't forget the marinara sauce. I have everything else I need for spaghetti dinner tonight. Now, there, there's some not so good things about this uh, wonderful future. I mean, let's suppose for the sake of argument that uh, uh, the, the Japanese have invented an internet-enabled bathroom scale. When you step on the scale, it figures out which family member you are based on your weight, and it sends that information to the doctor, and it becomes part of your medical record, which on the surface doesn't sound too bad, but there's only one problem. The refrigerator is on the same network. <laughs> so you come home and you see diet recipes coming up on the display, or maybe it just refuses to open. It's terrible. I mean, it's just an awful future. Well, I don't have time to, to uh, pick on all of these other things, but I, I wanted to mention a couple of uh, ideas. You know, you know, when we send astronauts up into space, we send them up there with instrumented clothing so we can keep track of their vital signs and make sure that they're okay. And I thought, well, gee, what would happen if all of our clothes were internet enabled? You know, what could you do? Well, let's see. You could send uh, a, an SNMP message to the sock drawer, and you'd get back a report saying, you know, there are 17 matched pairs of socks, but sock number 144L is missing. So you'd send a multicast message around the house, right? <laughs> you get back a note saying, you know, hi, this is sock 144L. I'm under the sofa in the living room. And it, so we've just solved the problem of the missing sock, and it's a wonderful contribution to society. I have to tell you, 
this group is absolutely the best one to tell that story to because you, you actually know what all those acronyms mean. Well, there's another possibility though, and it's, it's one that uh, is quite real. Um, sensor networks are becoming an increasingly common part of the internet environment, and you can kind of see why. I mean, you gather the data, and then you have to put it somewhere. People have to get access to it, and so the net is a very natural place to put all of that stuff. And I, uh, I've actually begun to uh, experience this myself. Uh, I didn't bother checking to see whether I could get this information online. Uh, so this, these are just canned images. But I have an IPv6, uh, six low pan network running in my house. Uh, it's a commercial product uh, from a company called Archrock. Uh, it's measuring the temperature, humidity, and light levels uh, with two different sensors uh, in every room in the house. And it's gathering these samples every five minutes. Now, my purpose in installing it was, first of all, I thought it'd be cool to have an IPv6 network at home. But second, I actually wanted at least a year's worth of information so that I could then analyze the results to see how well the heating, the uh, ventilation, and air conditioning had worked for the course of the year as we go through the seasons uh, in northern Virginia. So I could see uh, all of this information for every room in the house. Of course, the most important room in the house is the wine cellar. And uh, that's also instrumented, and you can imagine keeping things below 60 degrees and at a humidity over 80 percent was very important. Uh, the system is self-organizing, and so although this is an eye chart, all those various lines are the measure of radio level signal levels between the various uh, sensors. The sensors are act acting as store and forward devices in addition to uh, capturing information. So it's a self-organizing network. Uh, that tries to maintain connectivity uh, even when some links break. Um, when you uh, pull up the data, the summary data, uh, once again, it's an eye chart, but what you're seeing is the list of all the sensors that are in the house plus the temperature and the humidity uh, and the light levels on each. Uh, and you can get slightly more detailed information looking at this sensor um, in the wine cellar. Uh, you get the, the uh, sense of you know how how much variation there was in temperature. Not very much, actually, uh, less than a degree or light levels. In fact, some of the spiking light levels will tell you that somebody went in to the wine cellar because uh, you know the lights got turned on. I'm always interested in that when I'm away, in particular. Uh, <laughs> but uh, somebody did point out to me that the system is incomplete. And I have to admit, that's probably right, because I can't tell which bottles are in the cellar. I only know what temperature they're at and what the humidity is, and maybe the, the door opened and closed. So uh, it was suggested that I should put RFID chips on each bottle and an RFID sensor uh, in, the, uh, in the wine cellar, and so I could tell if a bottle left the wine cellar without my permission. Uh, and someone has pointed out to me that RFID doesn't work well, uh, it doesn't penetrate water very well, and since wine is about 99% water, uh, this could probably turn out to be a, um, a difficulty. But setting aside that problem, I still have an incomplete design, right? Because somebody could go in, drink the wine, and leave the bottle there, and I don't know if the bottle's empty or full. So I need another sensor in the cork that tells whether or not I have any wine inside, and if I'm going to that much trouble, I might as well put in some sensors that detect the esters that are in the bottle, so I might be able to figure out whether or not the bottle has got to the, to the point where uh, it's ready to drink. At the very least, I should be able to record in each bottle temperature and humidity and so on for every you know, few minutes uh, interval, so I have a history of each bottle. And that way, you, before you open the wine, you interrogate the cork to find out the history of the bottle. And if you, know, if you discover that on, you know, July 4th, 2004, the temperature got up to 102 degrees because the uh, cooling system failed. That's the bottle you give to somebody who doesn't know the difference. And it's, so, so I clearly have some development work to do. But the point I want to make is that sensor systems are going to become increasingly common as part of the net. Uh, Deborah Estrin at UCLA runs the Center for Embedded Network Systems, and she's already seriously contemplating sensors on mobiles so that we can detect various and sundry uh, hazardous substances or other conditions that might be inimical uh, to people uh, and gather that data as part of the internet environment. There are some other things that are going on, and I suspect every one of you knows a good deal about this. The uh, domain name system is uh, due for a significant upgrade 
there have been non-Latin domain names registered in the Internet up to but not including uh, the top-level domains, and we're now in the process of where I, I'm sorry, ICANN is in the process of organizing uh, an opportunity for people to uh, bid for or request or propose new top-level domains expressed in uh, other than uh, Roman characters. Uh, this is, makes a lot of sense for people especially uh, whose languages are not expressible in Roman characters. Uh, it also leads to, some, to potential complexity. For example, uh, if you look at the Greek alphabet, the Roman alphabet, and the Cyrillic alphabet, you discover a great many letters that look very, very similar. In fact, some of them are identical. Uh, and you can't tell the difference just by looking. Uh, so there's a risk factor here in introducing these uh, large number of new symbols for domain names that some confusion uh, will result. In fact, the uh, IETF is in the middle of revising the IDN uh, protocol specifications uh, in order to try to reduce the likelihood of uh, this kind of confusion, but it won't be absolutely eliminated technically. It has to be a decision by the registries. Uh, about which things will be permitted and which things will not in order to reduce the risk that someone registers an inimical domain name. A good example of that was uh, registration of paypal.com except that the A in PayPal was Cyrillic instead of uh, Ro Roman character and you couldn't tell from just looking at it so clicking on a link takes you to a site that looks like a perfectly good screen scraped uh, image of PayPal and it invites you to log in with your username and password and then it says oh gee there's a little problem here uh, you'll have to log in again and of course they vector you off to the real PayPal site and you innocently log in again meanwhile the other guy is busy cleaning out your account so there are some issues associated with this uh, that need to be dealt with you'll be faced with some of those as part of the operations community uh, V6 we talked about already and finally digitally signed domain names uh, already several of the top level domains like the ones in Sweden and Bulgaria and Puerto Rico and so on are digitally signing uh, their zone files uh, there's a considerable interest in having the root zone file digitally signed and there's discussion going on in fact some of you will have seen a recent uh, announcement a notice of inquiry um, from the um, National Telecommunications and, Inf and Information Agency, NTIA, which oversees uh, ICANN and the uh, root zone file management, uh, asking for a commentary on, uh, several, on two particular proposals for digitally signing the root zone file. Uh, so this is an important uh, introduction of yet another mechanism uh, in order to reduce the uh, possibilities that people are spoofing the domain name system. Some of you who lived through the Kaminsky uh, uh, event uh, will know exactly what I'm talking about. I know at Google we scrambled to update a lot of our implementations of domain name servers in response to that revelation. Google's also uh, released uh, recently an Android operating system for mobiles. In fact, you'll be seeing mobiles from T-Mobile uh, coming out using that operating system soon this month. Uh, and we also released a new browser called Chrome. Uh, I bring that up partly because, uh, of course, we're, we're hoping that these open source uh, op options will uh, help people uh, in find new ways of using the Internet. And particularly, Android is intended to allow mobiles to download and run new applications more easily. Chrome has been designed to be more resistant to various forms of attack. In particular, most browsers now have become the source of or the, the uh, vector through which uh, a lot of infections occur. The problem is that the natural way a browser works is to, to download a file from some website and then interpret whatever it finds. In the old days, it was finding simple things that said, put this text here and put this uh, image over there, and it wasn't much else. But these days, it includes things like JavaScript or Java code or other high-level languages some of which are uh, intended to interfere with or somehow subvert the operation of the uh, laptop or desktop client uh, that's doing the downloading. Uh, the, uh, uh, let's say the overly uh, permissive browsers uh, are effectively an open path through which infection occurs. The people who want to put these infections in your laptops or don't want to ruin your laptop anymore. What they want is to uh, Shanghai those uh, machines to be part of their botnet armies. And so uh, the uh, millions of zombie PCs and laptops that are part of the botnet armies are now being used to generate spam 
being used to mount denial of service attacks. There was a, a while when I thought those people wanted to destroy the Internet, but I realize now that they don't want to do that. They want to keep it running because it's a business for them. They rent out their botnet armies for other people to cause trouble, uh, and they make a living at it. So they don't want to – it's sort of like a, uh, a virus that – or a bacterium that should not be too successful because if it kills its host, it doesn't propagate itself. So I've even heard stories, and I don't know how much credibility to put into them, but maybe you'll be able to say that the uh, people who develop the, the various viruses, worms, and Trojan horses actually, after infecting the machine, will defend the machine against other people trying to infect the machine so they don't lose the members in their botnet armies. And so, you know, somehow we ought to be able to twist that around and be useful for us, but I'm not quite sure exactly how to do that. Um, I think also uh, one can anticipate an increasing amount of social networking taking place, and we've all seen uh, Facebook and MySpace and Orchid, uh, Second Life, and so on. Uh, all I can tell is that those activities, including video gaming, uh, are increasing, and that more and more people are finding this a useful and interesting way of spending time. Uh, I wanted to spend just a moment on IPTV because it turns out that uh, for all practical purposes, most people who uh, talk about um, IPTV are thinking uh, mostly streaming video. And I'd like to suggest to you that streaming video is a very narrow view of what we can do with TV or video on the Internet. Let's imagine for the sake of discussion that you're living in uh, Sweden, Stockholm, maybe you're living in Kyoto or another part of Japan where you can get access to the Internet at speeds in excess of a gigabit per second. If you actually have that kind of access, then downloading an hour's worth of video takes about 16 seconds, maybe more if it's an HD TV hour. But the fact is that that's a very different kind of video on demand than what we're typically uh, taught to think about, which is simply beginning a streaming video as somebody clicks on something. If you look at uh, people who use iPods, for example, they download their uh, songs faster than they can listen to them, and then they play them back. You can imagine doing the same thing with video. In fact, those of you who use YouTube will have already noticed that the little download bar is running ahead of the presentation of the video. So in some sense, that's downloading faster than real time, uh, and you're simply catching up while you're watching it uh, being uh, displayed. So I think that there are, uh, I think it's highly likely that if the internet speeds continue to rise at the edges, and of course if the core keeps up, uh, that people will find new ways of using video that have nothing to do with the kind of scheduled broadcast that has uh, been the hallmark of conventional television. So instead of racing home to watch an 8 o'clock broadcast or something, uh, you can simply have it automatically downloaded or download it uh, at your leisure and then play it back. Now, those of you who use TiVo or personal video recorders have already experienced the time shifting that's possible. But there's more to this than just the time shifting. Uh, if we, in fact, are going to use um, an Internet to transfer files of video content, those files, because they're packetized, can carry everything, not just audio and video, but it can carry, you know, the book that's associated with the movie, the biography of the actors and actresses and the uh, director, uh, a game that goes along with the, with the uh, particular uh, entertainment, uh, or maybe some other kinds of information, maybe even a program. It's all coming to you by way of packets because the packets don't care what they contain. They just know that they have a bunch of bits to be delivered. Well, that suggests to me that advertising information could be incorporated into this. Now, some of you might immediately say, advertising, I hate television advertising. It gets in the way of everything. And you're right. Typical advertising interrupts the show. It's temporal, and it drives everybody crazy, and they use TiVo to skip over them. I'd like to suggest to you that we've learned something at Google about advertising, mainly that nobody wants it unless it has information in it that they care about. And then, oddly enough, advertising isn't annoying. Advertising is useful information, but only if you're interested in it. So why not let people have some control over the advertising that they see in the video medium in the same way that uh, you have control over advertising when you're surfing the net and you're clicking on, uh, if you decide to click on some search result that includes a, an advertisement uh, in the Google service. So imagine for a moment that uh, while you're watching a video that some of the objects that are in the field of view are sensitive to touch or, that, or to mouse click. 
So maybe there's a Mercedes Benz or uh, maybe a nice bottle of wine or a nice, uh, maybe it's a Macintosh laptop that's in the field of view and as you mouse over it, a little window pops up saying, oh, I see you're interested in the Macintosh that's here. Um, and if you happen to be online at the time, it could say, well, yeah, there's an Apple store about six blocks away from where you are, and there are five of those laptops available in their inventory. Would you like to buy one? Click here. Well, this kind of interactive uh, advertising is quite foreign to the traditional means of video in television, but I predict that that's going to be a very common way for people to get useful information from that medium rather than the one that we're all annoyed by. Whoops, back up. Now, you live some of these bullets, uh, and you dodge some of them too, I suspect. But I wanted to point out that the internet, despite its age, still has a great deal of interesting and unsolved problem space. Security for sure, and you live that every single day. We don't even have the moral equivalent of airlong formulas in the internet. Uh, you'll be familiar, I, I'm sure, with um, uh, if you did any telecom design with the formulas that Mr. Erlon cooked up that say that a typical telephone call lasts for three minutes and has a nice bell-shaped curve, this helps you design how many lines you need, for example, to reduce the probability of not getting a dial tone to less than uh, one percent or whatever the, the uh, metric happens to be. Uh, we don't have Erlon formulas for the internet and there's a good reason for that. A telephone call is a very simple thing. It's a 64 kilobit chunk uh, circuit going from point A to point B and about a million ways to charge for it. That's the telephone system. The internet has this funny property that the applications are very in their demand for capacity. So you might be mouse clicking and sending a few bits per second and all of a sudden the next click has a 100 megabit per second file transfer fired up and no matter what formula you come up with for the statistics of the internet, tomorrow morning somebody will invent a new application that changes the statistics again. So we don't have very good airlong formulas which makes network design hard and I suspect that uh, part of your lives are colored by the fact that the designers don't have all the tools that they have in the traditional telecom world uh, to figure out exactly what capacity uh, to apply. We've already talked about, well, I, I don't want to go into the QoS debate too deeply here except to say that uh, uh, I've oscillated on alternate Tuesdays between the, the argument that we need mechanisms to um, assure certain kinds of performance to users who need low latency, for example, or high capacity uh, and I, on one side. And then on the other, next Tuesday, it'll be, why don't we just build more capacity into the net? All of the experience at Internet 2 with high capacity networking uh, suggested that building special quality of service mechanisms into the system did not do as well in terms of delivered results as simply building a bigger network. Uh, th there are arguments on both sides, of course, but I hope that the uh, bigger network guys win because that just means higher capacity for everybody. Uh, we've talked about internationalized domain names already. Uh, the network poses um, interesting opportunities and challenges for people who want to design distributed algorithms. We don't have a whole lot of applications that are really distributed in the net, but over time, I think more and more of them will uh, arise, especially as the sensor networks become part of our uh, application, or as data centers like the ones that Google builds or Amazon builds or, uh, or uh, Microsoft builds. All of these various um, distributed systems are best used if you can actually run algorithms that can make use of computing in more than one location. Uh, we don't have time to go into all this. So I'll tell you one thing I am embarrassed about. The Internet's design does not do well with mobility. Uh, the original mobility was uh, focused primarily on the packet radio network, which allowed plenty of mobility within one network's uh, operation. So as you move from one place to another, the packet radio network kept track of where you were kind of like roaming within, not roaming, but kind of moving around within a given uh, uh, local telephone system, uh, mobile telephone system, where the base stations are handing off from one to the other because they know where you are. That's not the same kind of mobility that we're experiencing today. What we experience today is that we move from one access point in the internet to some other one. We get on a plane and we move someplace, or we go, uh, you know, drive 100 miles, and we're actually connected to a different part, of, uh, different topology of the network and we don't do very well. If you've looked at mobile IP and V4 and V6, you'll find that it's uh, not a very efficient 
kind of uh, management of mobile operation. And the reason for that, in part, is that we bound the IP address too tightly to TCP and UDP. And it wasn't obvious at the time that this design work was being done, but looking at it today, it's clear that we need to break that binding somehow. Uh, that same solution by breaking the binding and having endpoint identifiers that are unique and independent of and associated with IP addresses would also solve the multi-homing problem because then it would be possible to accept traffic from multiple sources that have assigned you different IP addresses but then higher level up sees all of that as part of a common end-to-end -end communication. Uh, this would also help us with multi-path routing because uh, today we tend to write uh, routing algorithms that find a path and stick with it until something goes wrong and then uh, switches to another one. But sometimes there are multiple paths between pairs of uh, points in the net and we could get more capacity from end to end if we would allow the traffic to go over more than one path at a time. Another embarrassment is broadcast. Uh, in some sense, we take broadcast media and we turn them into point-to-point -point media. That's basically what we've done with 802.11, for example. Uh, it, whereas there are some cases where broadcasting would actually be very efficient. If you need to move the same information to a large number of parties, then transmitting by broadcast is actually very efficient. So I imagine having a satellite transmitting down to a million receivers, and if everybody wanted to get the same piece of code or the same entertainment information, they could all get it very efficiently, whereas sending it one-to-one on, one one or one at a time is very inefficient. So we really should be thinking about taking real broadcast media and putting new protocols in place that take advantage of that as well. Well, I'm not going to be able to go through every single one of these, but uh, another area where there needs to be research is authentication, identity, and authorization. We do not use authentication very effectively in the Internet today. People are still using usernames and passwords. And they're often using reusable passwords, which means that they're often very vulnerable to dictionary attacks and other kinds of things. We really should do a better job of securing the authenticity of the endpoints of the net, the computers that are talking to each other, the users who are using those computers. You know, what machine am I really talking to? Who really sent this email? Those kinds of things are important. I'm not arguing, by the way, that we should insist that there be that kind of authenticity for every single use of the net. So I still believe that anonymity is a useful tool, but I think it's also important that you be able to invoke strong authenticity when you ask for it. And if you don't get a satisfactory response, you can decide to terminate communication with that party because you're, they're not revealing uh, strongly who they are, and you can decide you don't want to deal with them. Um, Intellectual property protection is turning out to be a, a very interesting challenge in the network environment. When you think about it, copyright means literally that, the right to copy. And in order to um, enforce copyright, you basically inhibit people from making copies of things illegally. But the Internet works by copying. That's the only way it works. You copy stuff from a website, download it into your browser, and then you look at it. So the copyright community and the internet community are kind of fundamentally at odds with each other. We have to come to some resolution here, and I think the answer is to step back and seriously ask whether copyright is the correct way in which to protect people's intellectual property or whether we should find other ways of compensating the, the creators of that intellectual property without necessarily inhibiting copying. Uh, so that's a challenge for the lawyers and the engineers. Um, Law enforcement is something that I suspect a few of you are involved in from time to time. You may get uh, requests uh, from courts uh, to assist in surveillance uh, and other kinds of things. The problem with the Internet is it's global in scope. And so ab abuses occur, and they sometimes originate in one jurisdiction, but the victim is in another. We don't have any uniform treatment of these kinds of problems. Uh, there are... Uh, Agreements, sometimes Interpol being an example of an international agreement, uh, there may be bilateral or multilateral uh, agreements in order to do law enforcement in these environments, but the Internet really is a huge challenge for that community. Uh, and I think that we're going to see an increasing amount of demand for commonality in treating various kinds of abuse. Fraud occurs on the network, all kinds of other bad things happen. And uh, in order to deal with those problems, we're going to have to seek uh, international agreement on, you know, what's privacy, for example, or what, con what consists of fraud and what kinds of abuses are we going to declare are globally unacceptable from the social point of view and then attempt to enforce that, uh, that position. 
I'm going to skip this part for a moment and then come back to the other things. Uh, we talked a little about uh, intellectual property, so uh, we'll leave that. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee has been working for some decade now on the semantic web, and the, uh, although I have not dealt too deeply personally in this, I'm beginning to get quite interested in the idea that uh, we might, it might be possible to understand more deeply what the content of the web is when we're helping people search for things. So at Google, we care a lot about this deeper sense of what is the meaning of the words that we're encountering in the net. We index all those words. And then we tell you where the words show up in the web pages, but we don't know what they mean. And in, in some sense, uh, as one intern at Google said, today we navigate people to a document. Wouldn't it be interesting if we could navigate them to answers? And of course, in order to do that, uh, we have to know what the question was that they were asking. And frequently, we don't have that. We can only guess at what they were interested in because they wrote down some search terms. So the idea of being able to get a deeper semantic understanding is interesting. Uh, the problem is that language is ambiguous. So a small example, the word Jaguar could mean the operating system, it could mean the car, it could mean the animal, and when somebody searches for Jaguar, we don't know which. Tim Berners-Lee's idea is that you could declare this ambiguity and you could codify it, you could make it known to the software that's doing the searching so that as you crawl through the web and you find hyperlinks that say this, there's information on that web page that might be of interest, you also encounter these semantic, I'm going to call them semantic hyperlinks, uh, that say, by the way, this word is ambiguous, there are three different meanings, and here are some examples of the three different uses of the word. And as your crawl software encounters these clues, it begins to learn more and more about the ambiguities and possibly uh, a way to deal with them. So if somebody says, search for Jaguar, we could come back if we knew about this ambiguity and say, did you mean the operating system, the animal, or the car? And a response would allow us to reorder the answers based on what we had learned about disambiguating the query. Well, I wanted to uh, take a little bit of time to point out a problem that I believe future historians are going to have. In fact, we may already be having this problem today. Uh, we're, when we create objects in, uh, with our laptops or with the uh, supercomputers that we use remotely, uh, we're creating very, very complex digital things. And as time goes on, the only way you can figure out what those digital things are is to have the software available that created them so you can interpret them. So a spreadsheet is a not very interesting pile of bits unless you have the software that lets you actually execute the spreadsheet. Uh, and if you lose the software, then the pile of bits you have is not very useful. I'm worried that we're already starting to encounter something called bit rot. And I'm, what I mean by this is simply that we've accumulated large files of bits with very complex structures and then we don't have access to the software anymore. It might happen because someone stopped serving that software or stopped supporting it. Uh, it's happening to me, some of my uh, photo images, for example, are no longer interpretable because there's some old form of JPEG and the latest software management tool doesn't recognize it. Uh, I'm imagining, you know, the scenario I have in my head is that it's year 3000. You just did a Google search and uh, you turned up a 1997 PowerPoint file. Let's even imagine you're running Windows 3000. And, uh, you know, the question is, does it know how to interpret the 1997 PowerPoint file? And the answer is probably no. Uh, that would probably also be true even if it was open source software that you were using. So the question is, how do we preserve the software that knows how to interpret the bits over really long periods of time? So as to have the digital world as well preserved as, for example, uh, thousand year old vellum documents are uh, from a period in a thousand AD or before. Uh, if we don't do something about that, it may be that even our uh, descendants in the year 2100 will wonder what was life like at the beginning of the 21st century and they'll, they won't be able to figure it out because all they will have is a pile of uninterpretable bits to look at. That's us. Just uninterpretable bits. Just bit rot. And I'd like, us for us, I'd like for us and our world to be a little more visible to our descendants than that. So let me finish up with the formal remarks with one other uh, quick uh, reminder. Google Earth, I'm sure many of you have used, and Google Maps. Google Earth uh, developed something called Google Sky, which is, lets you turn uh, your view outward uh, to the rest of the universe by stitching together uh, imagery from various telescopes, inclu including the Hubble Space Telescope. 
Well, that has led uh, me to uh, uh, become quite excited about a program that uh, my colleagues and I started at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory about 10 years ago called an interplanetary internet. Uh, we recognize that Mars, for example, has been a, a target of research and exploration for quite some time. Remember, we had the first Viking landers that landed on Mars in 1976. Uh, the deep space network, which was started in 1964, is used to communicate with uh, spacecraft that are in orbit around the planets or landing on the surface of Mars like the rovers did, uh, or more recently, uh, the Phoenix lander on the North Pole of Mars, which landed May 25th this year. Uh, these devices are uh, carrying a variety of instruments on board to gather information about the local environment, the uh, makeup of the materials that they find, the weather conditions, and so on. Uh, they clearly have to use radio communication in order to get commands from Earth and to deliver information back. What has not been common, however, is that these devices share common sets of protocols. They typically are uh, tailored to the onboard uh, instruments on each of the spacecraft. And so what my colleagues at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and I have sought to do over the last 10 years is to uh, develop a standardized set of uh, protocols for space communication so that all of the various devices, the robotic equipment and even the manned equipment, uh, can interwork successfully uh, using the same way that we interwork on the Internet. Now, we actually started out uh, thinking that we could get away with uh, using standard TCP IP to do this. Uh, that idea lasted about an hour and a half. You know, the first thing we noticed is that the distance between the planets is literally astronomical. And at the, at the speed of light, it takes between three and a half and 20 minutes for a signal to propagate from Earth to Mars one way, depending on where, you know, the two planets are in their respective orbits. And of course, it just gets worse as you go to the outer planets. Uh, so you can imagine trying to do flow control with TCP, right? You know, you basically say stop, and the guy on the other end doesn't hear you for 20 minutes and keeps transmitting at full bore, and all the packets are falling all over everywhere. So flow control doesn't work very well. And then there's this other little problem. The planets have a nasty habit of rotating. And, you know, we don't seem to be able to do anything about that. And so if you're talking to something on the surface and the planet rotates out from under you, you know, you have to wait till it comes back around again before you can communicate. Or maybe it's a satellite that's in orbit. And so it's a very disruptive environment and it's a very delayed environment. So if you're trying to do store and forward networking in that kind of environment, it's very hard to guess how long it's going to take before a message will go from one place to another. It's a little bit like email. The party you're communicating with in email uh, may not be online at the time that you send the message. You don't care. You know that it'll be held in the net, so to speak, until the person says, hi, I'm here, and I'm ready to receive mail. The interplanetary communication protocols that we have developed have that characteristic. We call them delay and disruption tolerant networking protocols. Uh, they've been in development now uh, for almost a decade. We've tested them terrestrially in a number of environments. Uh, we've tested them with the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency uh, in tactical military environments where they delivered anywhere from 10 to 15 times more capacity, more, more data through the DTN system than TCP IP in the presence of uh, highly hostile, uh, disrupted uh, communication, jamming, radio shadow, and things like that. Uh, we've also tested them in uh, civilian application with the SAMI. Uh, these are the reindeer herders in the northern part of Sweden, Norway, Finland, and Russia. Uh, we put um, Wi-Fi um, uh, hotspots in a couple of villages this summer, and we're using the DTN protocols on the, uh, in laptops on the backs of all-terrain vehicles that sort of wander into the village, dump the data off, pick up anything new, and wander off to another village. Uh, as a way of testing the um, ability of the protocols to deal with uncertain delay and, uh, and disruption. But the most exciting thing I can tell you is that uh, this month, at the end of this month, we're going to upload the new DTN protocols to a space platform called Deep Impact. You'll remember that this went out to rendezvous with a comet and sent a probe into the comet which uh, exposed some of the interior material to be uh, examined. The probe is gone, but the main platform is still available. It's in orbit around the sun. It's a very eccentric orbit. It's on its way back towards Earth. And towards the end of this month, it will be about 80 light seconds away. We're going to upload the new protocols to that platform and then run a series of tests in October and November 
We're going, we've been told we may be able to do it again in the springtime. Uh, the purpose behind those tests is to space qualify the DTN protocols. Once they are space qualified, uh, in fact, we are, we're also going to be uploading to the International Space Station at the beginning of the year and run another year's worth of tests on that. Once we complete all those tests, in, if they are successful, the DTN protocols will be uh, what's called uh, technology readiness level eight, which NASA and JPL, by which NASA and JPL mean that these protocols can be used in uh, live missions. So we're hoping by the end of 2009 that we'll have that qualification and that we can start putting the DTN protocols into all of the uh, missions, space missions that all of the uh, spacefaring countries are uh, undertaking. Uh, we've already presented the idea to the Consultative Committee on Space Data Systems, uh, which standardizes space communication protocols, and they've been very receptive to the idea. So what this suggests to me is that if we are successful in our uh, work, that as time goes on and each new mission gets launched, we will accrete uh, a, a kind of uh, interplanetary backbone of devices that are capable of, of interacting with each other. Uh, in, a, in a uniform way, in the same way that devices on the internet are capable of doing that. So we're not trying to build a big interplanetary backbone and hope that somebody will come. That's not the, the, the design principle is simply build to the standards just like we did with the internet and allow it to grow in the same way that the internet has over the decades. Well, that's uh, all the formal remarks that I have prepared in advance, but I'm happy to take some time for Q&A if uh, you're interested and if the uh, moderator allows it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sir. We certainly do have uh, a few minutes for some questions if people have any. Don't be odd. I it's okay. Have a demo. Yeah. Oh, there's a demo. Yeah. Okay, so you can, are we still on? Microphone is, the microphone is not working. Now it's working. If I clip it to my left mouse, it all works great. Um, for those of you who like toys, uh, this is the latest toy from Sony. It's called a Rolly. Anybody seen the YouTubes of this already? Uh, this is a $400 toy. Uh, it's got a Bluetooth interface. It has a USB uh, interface as well for recharging and programming. Uh, it lets you download your own music. And as you'll see momentarily, I hope that I'm not sure everybody will be able to see this, but let's see what happens. Okay. If you weren't right up here, you, you probably couldn't see, but the best thing was the tiny shiver of the little wings on the vibrato. Sort of just, <laughs> oh, it's amazing. It was, now, it well let, uh, let me tell you, this, there's a, there are about 40 or 50 tunes in this thing, some of them a lot more uh, dramatic than, the, than that one. Uh, but the thing is that it's very well engineered. It's very precise in its motions. You can, everything is there's like eight or nine degrees of freedom in this thing. Um, and because the, it's lifted off the surface of the table by these little rubber wheels, it can actually move around very, very precisely. 
So I've been thinking that what I should do is put a small camera on this thing and a microphone and then export it to meetings that I can't come to. So imagine you're sitting at a table, conference table, and you've got this little thing sitting here and it's you, you're remote uh, over the net, and, um, and you're listening to the conversation and you, somebody says something you don't agree with. So you steer this thing over to them and you say, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. And, you know, I think that would be incredibly intimidating to have this little thing roll. <laughs> Can you imagine just thinking, what? You know, you, uh, so, and you could run more than one of them at a time. So you could imagine a multiple screen display where you're participating in several different meetings, you know, and then you're buzzing around, sort of hollering at everybody. That'd be great. Okay, so that's for people who are, uh, you know, interested in really cool stuff. There's a piece of software that comes with it. As far as I know, it only works on a PC and not a Mac, which is too bad, um, for choreography. Uh, any of you who've ever done video where you've tried to do the video cuts to go with the beat of the music know that that's a fairly big challenge. This is much worse because, uh, well, in fact, let's see if I can get, uh, uh, if we really... So you get the idea anyhow. There's a, lot, there's a lot of fun you can have with something like this. All right, questions, issues, problems? Everybody wants to get out and get rid of the coffee they drank this morning. Well, there's a certain amount of that. I'm actually surprised that there's no more questions on the interplanetary internet because I know it's operational in at least 20 or 30 percent of the networks here and I just thought you guys would, you know, since you've already incorporated those network elements into your network designs, I thought you guys would have more questions. It's all right, not to worry about it. <laughs> like I said, talking dinosaur. Okay. Excellent. Well, I thank think you we're done. Much. All right. Thank you. A uh, quick schedule note. So we are on break right now. Um, there's probably food and more coffee to uh, solve your problems uh, outside. Uh, be back in half an hour. Thank you very much. <laughs>